questions. There are questions everywhere, and especially with Warcry, you have a lot of new players coming in, and they ask a whole bunch of different things. Maybe they might be returning players, and they're asking these questions about the game. And what you get each time is a lot of very similar answers. So today, what I've done is I have trawled through Reddit, I've trawled through Facebook, through the Discord, all sorts of other platforms. I've trawled through my comments to find your top 10 most asked questions about the game. Maybe they're rules questions, maybe they're army list building questions, maybe they are questions around your miniatures and what to use, and we're going to answer them today. So I hope that you enjoy this and it's something that's going to be useful to you. After you've watched the video, if you have any other things that you might want to know about Warcry or anything about the surrounding game, please put it down in the comment section below and we'll be back for another round once I've got enough and we will hope to answer them as well. So question one, can I use my Warcry 1.0 stuff? This is fairly common for players who's getting back into the game. Maybe they used to play Warcry before the transition to Warcry 2.0 earlier on last year. And essentially it's fairly simple. If you had one of the core sets or the starter sets maybe from the first edition of Warcry, there are a bunch of things you can use and then there are a bunch of things that you can't use anymore because they're now out of date. Obviously the core book, the rules have changed somewhat so you won't be able to use the core book anymore. The tokens you will still be able to use so that's absolutely fine. The mission and terrain decks you'll also still be able to use for your games. There hasn't really been much of a change over from Warcry 1 to 2 in those decks and the later boxes have been released say Sundered Fate, Heart of Gur, all of these ones. They've only really served to expand out those decks to give you more missions and more terrain options but your 1.0 cards they'll still serve their purpose you'll still be able to play your games. The miniatures themselves of course you'll be able to use every single Warcry miniature made the transition over to Warcry 2. All of those special rules and all the rules for every single one of the warbands you'll be able to download off of Games Workshop's Warhammer community website. Similarly with the terrain you don't need any of the new terrain you can use the old terrain if you want. Just remember but if you are using terrain, Warcry benefits from verticality. So if we're talking about the starter set, as we can see here, there are a lot of bridges, there are a lot of platforms, that kind of thing. And especially Warcry as it's played today really does benefit from that. And you'll just be able to have better games if you include that verticality into your terrain. The Warband cards themselves, they used to be released in the boxes as we can see here, or in separate decks if we're talking about the Age of Sigmar factions. Those Warcry cards are now obsolete. All of the points costs have been updated and a bunch of the cards themselves. Some of the fighters have had some changes in terms of their stats. So you want to be using the new profiles, again, that are available over on Warhammer Community. Similarly with the ability cards, you want to be using the new ones. I wouldn't recommend you use the old ones because some of the abilities have gone through major overhaul and major changes throughout the editions. Are one box bespoke warbands competitive? As you can probably tell, I get this question a lot. A lot of people ask it and I give the same reply every single time. The one box warbands that you buy from Games Workshop, maybe it's Rock My Creed, maybe it's Hunters of Wanchi, Jade Obelisk, whatever it is, maybe it's the old ones, maybe it's the new ones, they're more like Age of Sigma or Warhammer 40k starter sets in that you can buy one box and that box is basically enough to get you going for whatever points level that you're playing at. In this case, Warcry is a thousand points. Just like those starter sets, some can be good and some can be less good. But in the same way that you wouldn't expect one of those starter boxes to be able to compete with a fully written out army list with access to the entire model range, you shouldn't really expect one box bespoke warbands to be able to compete with other full maybe Age of Sigma warbands with one or two fighters from three or four or maybe the entire range's worth of sets and really something that's been designed specifically to be as optimum as possible. I think when playing box warband versus box that's absolutely fine. The game is kind of balanced that way but if you're going to play single box warbands versus other finely tuned box warbands or Age of Sigma warbands. And what you're really going to want to do is buy those extra boxes, get the units that you need, look into your allies, buy the allies that you want, and really design your warband properly in order to compete with those 
other warbands. It's effectively a different kind of format of Warcry that you're playing at that point. And like I said, I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect a single one-box warband to be able to compete with something that's fully tricked out. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't weaker and stronger bespoke teams. There most definitely are. But for the most part, if you build any of the bespoke warbands from scratch and focus on some of the more efficient fighters and focus on a specific game plan that you want to use, maybe bring in a couple of allies, then you'll have a much better time against designed warbands as they are. And you'll find yourself able to compete under most situations. Which faction should I choose? Your choice of faction is, it's another fairly common question that's asked. People say, all right, I want to play Warcry. Uh, how, what, what should I pick? How should I play? There are a number of different ways for you to decide what faction it is that you're going to play and what you're going to pick. One is just by aesthetics and like background, which is kind of what this whole decision thing is about that you can see behind me. But the reality is, like any other Games Workshop game, playing the game itself is probably only about 20% of what you're going to be doing. Most of the time you're going to be building miniatures, you're going to be painting miniatures, and you're going to be modeling with them. And then at the very end of that, you'll be able to play them. Now, unless you're one of those players who likes jumping in between different factions themselves, just building the guys and then smashing them out, that becomes a very expensive way of doing things and picking things. So my advice that I would give would always be to pick whichever warband you feel has the coolest models. Because at the end of the day, those are the models that you're going to be building the majority of, and those are the models that you're going to be painting the majority of. And then you can kind of worry about their play style and what they're going to be doing and how you're going to be building them a little bit later. Because when you first start out, what really matters is getting a feel for the game and making sure that you either identify with or have a real good sense of, yes, these are the, these models that I'm playing, they're super cool, and narratively in my own kind of headcanon, I can get where they're going and I can get what they're doing. There are a couple of other ways to do it, depending on how you want to play the game. If you're only really interested in playing at the top levels of tournament and competitive play, then there are a whole host of resources that you can look at to see what are the best warbands, how they play, and what they're doing. So you can pick that way. But I think this goes for the majority of players. That they basically want to play warbands that look really cool and then maybe after that have a very specific play style on the tabletop. So yeah, that, that's, that, that's what I would advise. Go with what you really like the look of and then after that you can worry about how they play and how they're built. Because using the ally system, you can basically make most warbands do kind of almost whatever you want them to do. So in a casual or semi-competitive setting, it doesn't really matter what it is that you're picking. How do allies work? This is something that I've covered before in a previous video, and I will put the links down in the description below. But in short, you're allowed two allies or fighters with the hero rune mark in your warbands when you're building them. Warcry runs off of a rune mark system. So when it says hero rune mark, this is the rune mark that you're looking for, or the kind of clenched fist is the allied rune mark that you're looking for. And you're allowed two of those. You're allowed up to one fighter with the monster rune mark, and then you're allowed up to three fighters with the thrall rune mark. The important thing is that all of these fighters have to be from your same grand alliance. So if you're playing one of the chaos warbands, then you need to make sure that your allies, monsters, and your thralls are also from other chaos warbands. I've given some examples here. A fighter with the ally rune mark might be the Fomorid Crusher. A fighter with the thrall rune mark might be our direwolves if you're playing grand alliance death. And a monster if you're playing grand alliance order might be the Charybdis. What does that look like when you are building your warband itself. I've got a very simple sample death warband here. The warband is Ossiarch Bone Reapers. I've tried to just fit as much stuff as possible into the warband just to give you a sense of how that would work and how that would fit. So the main warband itself is a Mortec Hecatos and we've got three Mortec God. We're going to be taking a Terror Geist. Then we're going to take an ally in the form of a Craven Huntmaster out of uh, Night Haunt. Again, both Grand Alliance Death. So you're going to be able to take your Huntmaster because it has the hero room mark. And then finally, we're going to take a Thrall of a Direwolf. Again, Grand Alliance Death. 
specifically a death thrall. Note for this one, there is space if you wanted to add a second ally and two more thralls and still have a legal list. But just for illustrative purposes, this is how it would look if you were trying to put everything into one list. Finally, a special kind of ally is called Bladeborn, and Bladeborn allows you to use your Warhammer Underworlds models in your games of Warcry. I've done a fairly extensive uh, video on Bladeborn already, so I'm going to put the links to that down in the description below, and I'm going to put a thing up top so you can see what that is. In short, what you're going to be doing with Bladeborn is you're going to be allying in the leader, and the leader will take up one of your ally slots as normal, and then you can take any amount of Bladeborn fighters from that leader's warband as additional allies, but they're not going to take up any of your slots. Please check out that video. It goes in depth how Bladeborn work, building with Bladeborn, how you would use them, that kind of thing. So it's something that I would recommend. Reactions, how do they work? How do you use them? And how do you get the most out of them during your games? Right, so reactions themselves are fairly simple. They essentially comprise of two things. You've got your triggering condition. So the thing that makes your reaction work or the thing that you are reacting to. And then you've got the effect of the reaction or what happens once that initial condition is met. There are a bunch of caveats to reactions as to when you can use them and how you can use them. They can only be made during an enemy fighter's activation. And in order to make your reaction, one of the two following scenarios has to be true. The fighter who's making the reaction either has not activated yet that battle round, or the fighter has already activated that battle round, but they're waiting. The reason for this is because the reaction itself will take up one of your two fighters available actions that it would normally be able to take during that round. You can only make one reaction to each enemy activation. So you can't have, for example, an enemy fighter made a move action, and got into range of two of your fighters, and you had a reaction on both of your fighters that could be activated when your opponent makes a move in, you're only allowed to react with one of those fighters. You can't react with two because you're only allowed to use one reaction per enemy action itself. If your fighter has not yet activated that battle round, they can make up to two reactions. Each time they make a reaction, they're going to reduce the available amount of actions available to them by one. If they only make one reaction, they are able to activate themselves later on in the battle round. They only get one action because of that. If they're waiting already and then they use their reaction, that's going to remove their final action point. And that fighter has no extra moves or anything that it can do during that turn. Next up, we're going to talk about line of sight, how it works, and how you get line of sight and visibility to your enemy fighters. Okay, so visibility is really important. You'll see a lot of actions, especially fight actions, and a lot of abilities themselves will require you to have a visible enemy fighter. The rules of visibility are pretty simple. One fighter is visible to another fighter if you can draw a straight, uninterrupted line between any two points on that fighter. So this could be from the tip of spears, it could be from the tops of swords, from the head of your fighter to anywhere on the opposing fighter, and it has to be unobstructed, so not passing through solid walls. And if you meet that criteria, then you have visibility. Let's take this scenario, for example. We got a Hunters of Huanchi guy. He is looking at a desecrator who's sitting behind a tree. He wants to throw his javelins, and we need to find out if he's visible or not. So what we can do is we can take a model's eye view, and we can see that, yes, he is visible for the purposes of any action or ability. Here's another scenario for you. We've got our claw. He's up on the platform, and we've got the Jade Obelisk underneath. Would you be able to see him, fire your javelins down, use your abilities? The answer is yes, you can, because between the slats of the bamboo bridge, you can see the enemy fighter, so they are visible. Link to visibility, we're going to be talking about range. Are you in range? How do you measure range? How do you measure range here? It is not from the closest part of a fighter to the other closest part of a fighter. If you're measuring range like this, from the tip of the Huanchi's claws javelins over to the Jade Obelisk, you'd be measuring wrong. The right way to measure range is you measure from base to base directly, regardless if it's actions, if it's abilities, or if it's anything else that requires you to check range or check distance over to your target. Linked to range and visibility is cover. How does cover work exactly? 
Cover is actually fairly important, especially if we are talking about ranged attacks. What kind of defenses can you get? Cover is going to give the target fighter plus one toughness. So knowing who is and who isn't in cover actually becomes fairly important if you're going to be playing against one of those more range heavy warbands. Cover itself essentially comes from two sources. It'll come from obstacles and it'll come from platforms. For obstacles, what you're going to be doing is drawing a one millimeter thick imaginary line between the bases of your two fighters. And if that imaginary line crosses over or through any piece of terrain, then the target is going to be in cover. There is one caveat to this. If the fighters are more than one inch away from each other, then what you're not going to do is count parts of obstacles within half an inch of a fighter making the attack. Let's say we do have a ranged fighter. He can go right up to a wall and he can shoot another fighter. And because the shooter is within half an inch of that wall, the wall will not count as an obstacle for the purposes of cover for the target. The second thing that offers you cover are platforms. If the fighter who's going to be making your attack action is two inches or more vertically below the target fighter, they can claim the platform as cover if those lines do pass through the platform. And the final thing to note is that friendly and enemy fighters do not grant cover. The act of hiding models behind other models, maybe you've got a very large cavalry piece and you want to hide your infantry pieces behind it, that will not give cover to enemy shooting. As long as they can see past or through one of your models, they'll still be able to shoot it, they'll still have visibility and you won't get the toughness boost. Next question, do abilities work on the user? This is actually one of the most commonly asked questions in Warcry. So to illustrate this, I want you to take a look at these two abilities. We've got Lead from the Back and Spurred by the Gods. Both of them add plus one to the attacks characteristic of melee attack actions made by fighters. Lead from the Back has very specific wording. Lead from the Back is attack actions made by visible friendly fighters when they're within six inches of the fighter versus spurned by the gods, which is attack actions made by friendly fighters within three inches of the fighter. Now that word visible is the most important distinction that tells you what the ability affects. Because models are not visible to themselves, if it says visible friendly fighter, any ability is not going to affect itself. And if it says friendly fighter, the ability will affect itself. Final question, where can I find rules for my stuff? The rules, the core rules, all of the warband rules, all of the abilities, all that kind of thing. That's all available on Warhammer Community. You can go there, you can download all those pages. However, I find as a more useful tool, we're going to be looking at warcryer.net. It lists every single rule. It lists any changes to those rules. It lists every single fighter in the game all of their abilities. It has an inbuilt list building feature. You can choose your the fighters that you want to play and it will look at the list that you build and it will auto verify it and it will tell you what's wrong with the list if it's illegal. It has everything you're going to need to want for rules purposes for Warcry. You can look it up. It's a great resource. I 100% would recommend it to anyone. Big props to ServoScribe for putting that together and for making sure that's something for the community to use. That's it for today. That was a rundown of essentially the internet's top 10 asked questions about Warcry. I hope that's something that was useful to you. If you have any more Warcry questions, please put them down into the comments below and I will look through them and maybe I can put together another video like this to go through even more questions that you might have. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments section below what you thought. And yeah, I will see you next time.